My name is Greg Reed, and I'm going to be your instructor for this uh, course. And um, I'm glad to be meeting all of you online. Uh, I've got some more people coming, so I'm just going to click admit. And in a minute or two, I will um, give us an outline for the day and um, let you know kind of how these sessions will go. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, resource you well. And if things are not going well, I'm very open to change. So please uh, let me know what you need. And uh, that way I can serve you best as your instructor for this course. Um, let's begin um, by I, just letting you know I'm recording the session um, for those that aren't able to attend and for your review afterwards, if you wish. And I will make a link available to the recording. Um, in order to start, I'm going to share my screen and have a PowerPoint so you can follow along. Hopefully that'll be okay. As well, there will be times where we're interacting with each other, and I'll explain how we can do that best. Um, initially, I'm expecting about 20 people on these calls. Right now, we don't have that many. We're only about 12 of us, so we'll figure that out as we go, see if others arrive. So let me just click some buttons and share my screen. I'm hoping that you can all give me a thumbs up if you can see this slide. Can you see the slide? Yes. Good. Yes, it's okay. Excellent. All right, so this is uh, teacher development, uh, teacher professional development. And um, in order to facilitate this, hopefully uh, on Zoom, we'll be able to do this well. Uh, the Zoom protocols that I would like to follow I know uh, many of you are probably familiar with Zoom, um, but what I'd love to do is to make sure that I can address you correctly. And unfortunately, I will get your names wrong because uh, they're probably not even spelt correctly in um, the, the Roman alphabet. And probably some of you have other alphabets. So uh, please forgive me if I um, don't get your names right. <laughs> Uh, if you could rename, so it's just your first name and last name on the screen that I see. Um, most of you have that already, but to rename, uh, you just click on the participants tab and you can select the rename icon and that way I'll be able to know what your name is. Also, um, again, too many screens. I'm going to say I'm a lot. I apologize just as I get set up here and get comfortable again on Zoom. Uh, if you're not speaking, mute your microphone, which most of you are doing. Uh, that just saves any distractions. Also, if you have a question or you want to stop me, I'm very open to being stopped. And uh, please interrupt if you don't understand any something or you have a question in the moment. Um, you can use the raise hand feature. Again, if you click on participants uh, or sorry, reactions. Uh, you'll be able to, um, under reactions, find a raise hand, and that will come up in the participants list, and that way I will be able to acknowledge that you want to say something. Or you can just put your question into the chat. Uh, that would be another way to do it as well. Uh, there we go. Excellent. And... Uh, I'd love to see your reactions. You don't have to. I am recording, and I know some people don't want their faces recorded. So uh, please feel free to keep your video off if you need to. But again, uh, video on is best if if that can happen. All right, a bit about me. Why why should I be teaching you this course? So uh, just so you know, uh, I live in Ontario. I've lived in Ontario my whole life. I was a uh, uh, a student in Ontario in, in elementary school and in high school. And then I decided foolishly, like many of us, I guess, to become a teacher and to work with students. And uh, it has been a rewarding uh, life to work with students. I have qualifications um, in Ontario. In Ontario, we have four divisions for teaching. The four divisions are primary, junior, intermediate, and senior. And uh, I have um, qualifications in three of those. I have never taught at the junior level. Junior level in Ontario is grades four, five, and six, which would be ages 10 to 12 or nine to 11. 
Uh, I have taught in the high school or the secondary school, which is grades nine. Uh, formerly, we went to grade 13, but now we only go to grade 12. And so that is the four years of high school. Intermediate would be grades nine and 10. Um, and then grades 11 and 12 would be the senior level. I was a business teacher, so I taught things like accounting, economics, and data processing. So I am very linear. I'm not so emotional. I am very business oriented. That's what I'm about. Uh, I also then uh, extended my education by getting my honor specialist in both business and contemporary studies. Contemporary studies in Ontario is everything from history uh, to social studies to economics. Uh, I focused on the economics because that's what my degree is in. And then, of course, I uh, did some qualifications to become a principal. I never became um, the head of a school, but I became the vice principal of several schools. And that's where I worked with Kathy Young, who is, um, I think most of you would probably have heard of the name Kathy Young. She is um, very high, the, high up in the Blythe Academy. And so that's why um, she knows me and trusts me to teach you this course. Uh, as well, um, I served as a high school teacher for many years and a vice principal for many years. Uh, I've done some other things outside of education as well, and uh, I've worked in world missions. And uh, unfortunately, I've never tra traveled to Myanmar, nor have I traveled to Turkey. However, my daughter has been to Turkey four or five times. So I've, uh, for those of you that are in Turkey, she's probably been in some of the places where you are. So that's a bit about me. And I told you that I have a daughter, but I also have a son and a daughter-in-law, and I have a grandbaby, and my, my wife. So working from um, the left of the screen to the right, uh, far left is myself, uh, then there's my wife, and then my son, Ian, my granddaughter, Adelaide, and then my daughter, Sarah. So Sarah is not holding her own child, she's holding her niece. And then my daughter-in-law, Emma, she's the mom to Adelaide. And my daughter uh, lives in Austria. And so the picture there is taken um, just in June as we visited my daughter in Austria, and that's her hometown in Steyr. So that's a little bit about me. Good. Any questions about who I am? Do you want to challenge my qualifications? Are we all okay? Yes. Yes, thank you. All right, and I just have to check the waiting room every once in a while. Okay, I think this is going to be all of us. Uh, good. All right. I would love, um, and I'll call on you to speak, but I would love each of you to just to say your name slowly and clearly for me. So hopefully I can get it right if I have to say your name and then where you are currently uh, located and then what you are teaching currently or, or what you will be teaching. Uh, if you could let me know, that would just help me define where we go with the course. So maybe I'll start with, uh, I'm going to say, say Han. Hello everyone. Uh, I am Seyhun. Seyhun. Uh, yes, Seyhun. Uh, I live in eastern part of Turkey in eastern Anatolia, uh, Elazığ city, city of Elazığ. Uh, I have been teaching uh, in the secondary school in state schools for about 23 years. Uh, but between 2008 and 2011, uh, I uh, worked in the Ministry of Education as a teacher trainer. And we had seminars and uh, in the coming European framework, curriculum and uh, skill-based language teaching processes uh, in all over Turkey, uh, approximately 70. We had seminars in 76 different cities and we came together uh, uh, about 80,000, 80, uh, uh, sorry, not 8,000, 43,000 uh, teachers of English wow. all over Turkey. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, the partners was uh, the partners were in the seminar were uh, the British Council, the Big Kent University, uh, American Embassy uh, were also the partners of that uh, progress. Excellent. Good to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Emma. Uh, the next person on my screen is Mayint. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Hi, hello. My name is Mia Uchi, and you can call me Angela. Uh, I'm the um yes I'm from Acumen International College located in Myanmar, Yangon City, and I'm working as the center director for the center, and okay. we are running um A levels programs and then CQ programs, and also we are about to launch our very first intake of OSST program. Excellent. Very nice meeting you all. Good to meet you. Um, 
The next person on my screen, I'm just going to spell it. It's M-Y-I-N-T. I don't know how to say that. Maybe it's me, no? Yes. Okay, Natalia, Natalia. Oh, okay, sorry, not Natalia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my name is Natalia. I'm from, originally I'm from Russia, but now I live in Turkey, in Antalya. So um, now I'm a uh, science teacher, but um, I'm fond of chemistry, so I'm a chemistry teacher, uh, but just on the here, I'm in uh, international college with IB education, yes uh so like and i work here for for this college like a science teacher so i'm fond of alternative education in russia i worked for yandex and in it sphere and i worked for alternative education so there so like a chemistry teacher so excellent yeah. good to meet you thank you all right. I think the the other person I was thinking of, I can't pronounce. I'm so terrible at these names. So M Y I N T Mayant Mayant Sapai. Uh, yes. Sapaya. 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 Yes. Uh, my name. My name is Sapaya. Uh, I'm, I'm from I'm from Myanmar. I'm I'm working at. Acumen International College, I'm teaching a level mathematics. I'm Excellent. also in this uh, OSST. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Elena. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Elena. I am also originally from Russia, but I moved to Turkey a year ago. Um, I am a high school English teacher. And uh, I just started with an Alfred Berkshire company and I'm representing it here. And uh, what we are doing is implementing the OSSD programs uh, in schools around Turkey. Excellent. Um, Meltem. Hi everyone. I am Meltem from Turkey, Istanbul. Uh, I'm an English teacher uh, in a high school, um, sorry. Uh, private school. I have been teaching uh, for about 16 or 17 years. Uh, for so long, I have been working with the age 10 and between 10 and 14 ages students. Excellent. Good to meet you. Uh, Irene. Is it Henry? Uh, Irene. Irene, Irene, okay. Oh. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, I am Irene Tang from Myanmar, and I'm currently teaching a level English at uh, Acumen International College. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Narmin? Uh, that's me. Hi, everyone. My name is Narmin. Originally, I am from Azerbaijan, but I've been living in Turkey for six years. Um, I teach English in high school, like um, kindergarten here. And this year, I um, represent Alfred Berkshire in Bursa, in the city of Turkey. And we uh, implement OSSD program for high school. Excellent. Uh, Latif? we can't hear your voice yeah unfortunately latif you're unfortunately we can't hear you it's too quiet yeah, is it, my name is LATIF. Is it surname is Sarah Lemes? Is it I am a is the origin country is Turkey and I'm living down in Istanbul in Tuzla, it's Canada College. Then return back now in Turkey six years. I'm normally when I was in England, as a London. Then is it uh, in now in Turkey in the college is Canada College a High School and, and nine years old and uh, four years old. 
And I'm a teacher that's in English, uh, readings and the grammars and teacher. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Henry. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Uh, well, I'm, I'm really glad to see you, Mr. Reed. Um, my name is Henry Fuddle, and uh, I'm at the, uh, I work uh, for Alfred Berkshire, head of um, academic units. And uh, we have been cooperating with uh, Blythe Academy uh, for almost a year now. Uh, very, very happy uh, to be uh, here and uh, love to enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Pinar. Okay, I'm sorry, I have a, a poor connection. That's why I couldn't uh, connect. Um, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Pinar Shen Yunul. You can call me Pinar because I'm used to it. They usually <laughs> say Pinar. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm a teacher, I'm an English teacher in the south coast of Turkey in Mersin, Yusuf Kalkavan Anatolian High School. I have been a teacher for uh, 26 years old. Ah, sorry, 26 years, but I've been in this school for like um, nine years. And I have a family, I have a son, he's in a university. And that's all from me. Excellent, thank you. Uh, who have I missed? I have missed um, Iqbal. Yep, you got my name right. Excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Iqbal. I'm tuning in from Yangon, Myanmar. I also teach at Acumen International College, and I'm a chemistry teacher. Apologies for the camera. My laptop does not come with a camera, and it's going to take me a while to set it up, so I promise I'll have it on by the, the next meeting. Uh, no problem, Iqbal. Iqbal, what's your last name? I don't have a last name. If you're asking for my Burmese name, it's Jomomo Teto, but I usually don't go by that, so Iqbal's sufficient. Oh, okay. I'm just wondering on my list, I don't have Iqbal, and so I'm wondering ah. which name um, you're registered with. Okay, it must be my uh, Burmese name, uh, Jomomo Teto. So okay. I'll, I'll spell that out here and just... Um, yeah, if you just put it in the chat, that would be perfect. Sure. Thank well, you. Excellent. Excellent. Did uh, what, did anybody not go? Did I miss anyone? I think we're good. Okay, on onward we will go. Uh, the way we will run these sessions is for the first uh, 50 minutes, five zero minutes, we will um, have some learning. And then uh, what we will do is from there, we will um, have a break. We will go off video, just turn off our video, mute our cameras, and we'll have about five, 10 minute break. And then we'll come back. The whole session is to be about two hours. Uh, if we don't need the two hours, we will end early. Um, when we meet, we are always meeting hopefully after you have done some work in the modules online. So what I hope is that most of you have been through module one online, and today we will re review module one. I will give you some hopefully some insights to module one, and each module has an assignment. And the assignment I would like you to complete but not to submit until after we meet online, because hopefully when we meet online, there may be something you learn and you may want to adjust what you've done in your assignment before you um, hand it in. Also, as you've hopefully noticed, I'm recording each session, and I know that um, some are not able to be um, at the sessions, and so we'll send the recording out after the session. Is that okay? Good. Uh, so the next thing uh, we will talk about is what we hopefully have read about in the opening module one session. And so uh, the Ministry of Ontario, or so the Ontario Ministry of Education. So I'm sure that you're aware that Canada as a country is divided into provinces, and each province uh, is responsible for education. So education is not run nationally in Canada. We don't have a Canadian Ministry of Education. We just have each province. So education in each province is, is different. It runs differently. Um, I have a brother that lives in British Columbia. 
and his children go to school there. And it's a very different system than it is Ontario. And Ontario, though, uh, for many, many years, has been one of the leading um, systems of education throughout the world. And it's why so many um, international schools will want to use the Ontario curriculum, uh, because it's it's been fairly well done. That doesn't mean to say it will always be a good system of education, and uh, it, 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 everything changes as time goes on, as, as political things happen. So in, in Ontario, we have three types of schools, and as you read, there's publicly funded schools, there's private schools, which is Blythe Academy is a private school, and then there are independent schools. And the way I like to describe this is that um, the publicly funded schools, while they are good, they can't meet the needs of all children. And so a publicly funded school um, has what we call in English, a lot of red tape, a lot of rules, a lot of conditions, and uh, the money that is received for those schools is directed very specifically to different parts of education. And while public education in Ontario is good, and probably 90, uh, 80 to 90 percent of all students, all children in Ontario would go to a publicly funded school, it doesn't meet the needs of all children because um, it, bigger classes, um, you have a, a breadth of teachers um, and their qualifications. Uh, you will hear some children come home from school and just be so disappointed in their teachers because the, the teaching system is unionized. Um, people get jobs and then they stay in jobs. Uh, I have great respect for teachers that start out and realize that they're just not that great of a teacher and then quit and go get another job. Um, and But sometimes that doesn't happen. And so public uh, funded education, while it's the biggest, uh, can have also some of the biggest problems. Blythe Academy, uh, my understanding was created uh, in order to solve some of those problems for some students. And so other private schools were created in the same way. Um, unfortunately, most private schools are only um, able to um, handle people that have wealth uh, because it costs money to run a school. It costs money to pay teachers. It costs money to have buildings and all those things. Uh, Blythe Academy is not the most expensive private school, um, but its real goal is to meet the needs of students that really couldn't make it in the public system and didn't have the uh, resourcing and support that was needed there. Independent schools are very similar to private schools. Uh, the big difference between private and independent is private would be what we call for-profit. They exist to make money. Uh, they'll deliver education at a high level, uh, but they do it in order to make a profit to pay teachers well. Independent schools are often linked to religious organizations because um, they want to make sure that their religion is taught. They want to make sure uh, that high moral standards are taught, and thus uh, they tend to not... Um, be as expensive because they don't pay their teachers as well because often the teachers are doing it out of a religious mandate or they're doing it to ensure a quality of education and um, in many independent schools because they're not for profit you'll have a spouse as a teacher um, and and their spouse has a really high paying job so they can afford to live and the uh, the school will run that way. And also they accept donations. And so sometimes they'll have a very generous donor that will allow students to come for free and things like that. So there's, there's one other type of school that we don't mention because it's not an official type of school. And that would be what we call homeschooling. So parents in Ontario can also just choose to teach their children themselves. And they have to then send documentation into the Ministry of Education, which we'll talk about a bit more. Uh, but each one of these schools um, has to follow the Ontario curriculum. And so in some way, they have to deliver the basics of the Ontario curriculum. Some do it faster than public schools, some do it slower, uh, but hopefully they all get to where they need to go. What we're going to talk about mostly in our course is secondary schools, also known as high schools. 
So secondary schools or high schools are for teenagers. Uh, generally, um, in Ontario, we have grades 1 to 12. Well, we have kindergarten and then up to grade 12. And uh, grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. So that last four years of school before you would go on to college or university uh, is called secondary school or more commonly referred to as high school. Um, in order to graduate from high school, you need to get the Ontario Secondary School Diploma, the OSSD. And it sounds like most of you are working to create programs in, in your countries that can deliver the OSSD requirements. And OSSD, and in the module as you went through, there were some very specifics about what's required um, for the OSSD. And that um, those requirements are, are huge. 30 credits are needed, 30 courses. So in general, for four years, uh, grade nine, you take eight credits, grade 10, you take eight credits, grade 11, you take eight credits. There's 24 credits. In grade 12, because it's more significant, you only have to take six credits. Some will take another eight and get 32 credits. However, they only need the 30. And it really depends on where they want to go after high school with what they'll do in their grade 12 year. Many that will go on to a more rigorous academic program, such as university, they will only take six because they will take um, more difficult courses that will get them into university and give them the requirements they need. If they're going right from high school to work, or if they're going to a college program, or if they didn't take the right courses in grade 10 and 11, they may take extra courses in grade 12 so that they get the requirements for their college program or their university program. And this is why um, teachers need to be very aware of the requirements for graduation, because when we give advice to children about which credits they need, we have to make sure that the credits they get match with their plans after high school. I'll tell you a few stories from my high school um, vice principal role. Uh, one horror story, one bad, bad story that happened was our head of guidance. And so our guidance counselor in Ontario is someone who helps you pick your courses, make sure you're taking the right courses for your goals. And so a young child in grade nine and 10 got to know their guidance counselor. And uh, the guidance counselor advised them to take some business courses, some things, because they wanted to go ahead and start a company when they left school and all this. And um, unfortunately, they had forgotten one year to sign this child up for an English course. And so the child thought they had everything they needed to graduate. And then at the about two or three weeks before the end of school, uh, we informed the child that they would not be able to graduate because they were still missing an English credit. Well, the guidance counselor was ashamed because he had actually pointed the student away from taking English, but forgot that he, they needed it to graduate. So we have to be very careful to make sure um, in that chart that was in the module to make sure they have the right courses in the right area, right? And if you have any confusion about that, please let me know, but I'll leave that to you to read and, and to kind of figure out the fine details, but they need 30 credits. Also, they need 40 volunteer hours. Now, this is a, a requirement, but it's a very easy requirement. And what the students do is they just go out and they volunteer for a camp that maybe they were part of. They volunteer with a sports organization that they were part of. And to get 40 hours over four years is quite easy. Most of the students wait until, well, some students are very diligent and right in grade nine, they get all their 40 hours in one week. <laughs> um, but the, the idea is that they serve an hour or two here or there and then gather their 40 hours, but very easy to get. And then finally, they have to pass uh, the Ontario um, Secondary School Literacy Test, which just means that they're proficient enough in English that they can advance their way through um, education. And again, that um, test is usually given in grade uh, 10, I believe. And so most of the students have that um, 
taken care of. We have some difficulty um, when students are changing schools. They might have been in a private school for a while, then come over to a public school. They might have been homeschooled a while. And it's only those students that have difficulty because they maybe missed the opportunity to take the test at one point. Wow, that's a lot about our schools and um, the information there and about getting the credits. Um, I wonder, do you have any questions around this? Is this things that you already knew? A thumbs up usually tells me we're all good or if you have any questions, so we're good. Okay. I just want to ask you a question, Greg, if, if it is possible. Sure. So you told me that uh, you, you told something, but I couldn't hear it. For the ninth grade, 10th grade, and the 11th grade, they take how many hours? Uh, you, you talk about something like that. Yes. So uh, each course, each subject, each course that a student takes, they need 30 courses to graduate. And usually eight in grade nine, eight again in grade 10 and 11. So three times eight, three years at eight courses is 24 credits. And then they have six credits in the last year. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. That's good. And I have a question. Sure. Yes, for those students who study online, yes, do they need uh, these uh, 40 hours, uh, volunteer hours? Or not? Always yeah. online. Always yep. they need the 40 hours. So, so those three components that are on your screen have to be met in order to get the diploma. Mm, yeah. Okay. And, and you bring up a good point, Natalia, that um, of the 30 credits, two are now to be done online. And the, the government has said it's important that students um, learn how to take uh, courses online, because if they don't have that skill in today's world, how are they going to move forward? And so two of the courses are to be taken online. If there's an issue where they are unable to take the courses online, there is a, a form that can be filled in to allow them to not have to do that. But it's very rare. Okay. Good. So they are going to take two, uh, two uh, hours for online and 38 hours volunteers. Right? Yeah. I, I, again, Milton, it's not eight hours. It's eight courses. And eight so, courses. yeah, so 30, 30 credits or 30 courses. Um, and, and if you read through the list online in the module, you'll know that four of those courses have to be English courses. One at grade nine, one at grade 10, one at grade 11, and one at grade 12. And then there's optional courses they can take as well. Uh, Henry, did you have a question? Um, yes, um, I just wanted to uh, add something not to confuse uh, everyone, but uh, how we do it here in Turkey, it's kind of a project uh, as an agreement with the uh, ministry. Uh, so we, have only we we do in grades nine and ten preparatory class for English language, and um, we count um, the lessons from the ministry in grades nine and ten, and then only for the ones who qualify for Ontario Secondary School Diploma, we uh, provide them after our agreement with seven credits for social sciences university path or eight credits for engineering. So OSSD oh. officially starts at grade 11 and ends at 12, seven or eight credits only. But that's uh, through an agreement done with the Ministry of Education in Turkey. Right. Yeah, and this is always the interesting thing. Um, even in Ontario, uh, the principal of a school is the one who signs and grants the OSSD, the diploma. And so there are ways that the principal can meet requirements outside of the requirements so we can make exceptions. And a principal always has that authority. Um, but again, depending on how far astray they go, they may need um, ministry approval for that. So it just goes to show that in any system, there's always exceptions. And so this is what can happen. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Henry, for that. Yeah, uh, pleasure. Good. The next thing I would like to do is just have a bit of a discussion around um, 
Oh no, let's let's do this first. We'll we'll talk about the course codes. So I was a business studies teacher. And so the course code that you see on your C screen starts with the, the letter B. And so B is one of the curricular areas in Ontario, business. A is for arts, E is for English, S is for science. You know, there's all these different codes. And again, they're listed in the module that you went through. And so the first three letters tell you what the course name is. It's a short form. And sometimes it doesn't line up perfectly like this example. This example is a business course and the course is accounting fundamentals. And so this was a course that I would teach um, and it, it makes sense. There are other courses that sometimes the letters don't make sense, right? So sometimes it's B-I-B -B, and that's business introduction to business makes sense. Sometimes it's BAT, that's business accounting with technology. <laughs> so, and we normally call it computer accounting. So BAT doesn't make sense. So at any rate, but the, the, cords are, the co codes are defined in the curriculum. Uh, the, the first three letters of the course code, the, the fourth digit or the fourth character in the code is the grade level. And because high school is four years, instead of saying grade 9, 10, 11, and 12, we just say year 1, 2, 3, or 4. So this course is a grade 11 course, grade 9, 10, 11. It's the third year, so number 3. The M tells you what pathway or type of course it is. And in the module, the, it showed you a bunch of different letters for different modules or, or, or types of courses, different flows. And so M actually stands for mixed. Um, mixed is it's both college and or university. So because in grade 11 and 12, we're often prepping the children um, for um, university or college, we want to know that they're taking the right course to get their requirements. Accounting can be taken at either a college level or a university level. So the reason the accounting course is mixed is because it preps them for both college and university. Um, if it was only a college course, it would be a C for college. If it was only a university course, it would be a U for university, right? And again, I would point you back to the module online so that you could see the different letters for the different course codes. And then the final um, letter is actually optional. A course could only have the five characters, but often it displays a sixth character because the needs of the specific school board of where it's being taught. Um, my school board where I worked, often 99% of the course had, and ended with the letter I because I just meant I, I don't know why. <laughs> it just meant it was a regular course. Uh, sometimes it would end with an X. And if it was an X, then it was often tied to another course, like a co-op education. So I, I might have run BAF 3MX if all the students were required to go out and do a, a cooperative education with an employer. So maybe they were half the time in the school and half the time working. So, but again, don't worry about the sixth character. It's different for every school board. And depending on the Blythe courts, Blythe will have its own letters for different things. And again, in the module, you can read a bit about that. Course codes can be confusing. Don't let them confuse you. They're just what they are. And often when we go to the curriculum document, it'll show us the course code. So we just know what it is. Any questions there? Yes, I have one sure. question. Yes, what about a letter W? Yes, as I um, I read about this, that it's uh, the streaming just for ninth grades or at, uh, it's for 10th, 11th and 12th grades. Yeah. That's yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, and we'll, we're going to have a discussion on, on streaming. And so, one of the things that has happened in Ontario recently, and it happens occasionally, um, the public. So, because it's a publicly funded school system, majorly, it's political, and so um, politicians and the public, as they elect elected officials, um, 
shout and and demand and want changes within the school system. And one of the most recent things that's happened in Ontario is streaming versus de-streaming. And by streaming, um, we mean when does a student decide whether they'll go to college or university or right to the workplace? When is that decision made? And as teachers, sometimes we know early on that a student academically will never get to university. But when should we make that decision? And so formerly in Ontario, everything was streamed starting at grade nine. So once you entered high school, you kind of had to make a decision. Am I going to college or university or am I just going to workplace? Um, however, they've now decided to add this W code so that some courses in grade nine will no longer be streamed, right? And so let's let's talk a bit more about that. Um, academic streaming, right? And so just as I've, I've suggested, if let's say my daughter in grade six and seven was not at the proper reading level for a grade six or seven. So she is now, you know, 13 years old, and she's not reading at the same level as the students around her. And somebody's come in, they've given her a test, and she's reading at three years earlier, right? So she's a 13-year-old, is only reading as a 10-year-old. And so we would say she's going to have some trouble taking grade nine English because she's not there yet. And so in Ontario, we basically have three streaming levels. We have the essential level, which is the lowest academic level. We have applied, which is the middle level. And then we have academic, which would be the most academic level. Thus, it's called academic. So again, essential at the bottom, applied, and then academic. And so if somebody is reading that poorly, we would probably put them into a an essential level English in grade nine. Well, that means they can never take applied or academic English because the requirement for grade 10 applied English is grade nine applied English. But if you only have grade nine essential English, you can't then take academic or applied. And so it's hard to break out of your stream. And so this is the same thing with math, with science, with all of the core courses. And so recently the government of Ontario has said, we are not gonna stream in grade nine any longer. Now pretend you're a teacher, a grade nine teacher. And now instead of only getting academic students in your English class or only getting applied or only getting essential, now you've mixed all three together into one class. Is that easy as a teacher? No, it's difficult because now you have to really deliver individualized educational program to each of the students. And in Ontario, currently, a grade nine class can have anywhere from 28 to 32 students. That's a big class. And so teachers find it hard to deliver three different curriculums, but it's what is needing to be done. And so I'd love to just open up to some questions. Uh, and, and ask these questions that are on your screen. So I've kind of described what academic streaming is. So can someone maybe think or, or tell me what a benefit is to that streaming? Second question, what are the benefits of streaming? Yes, um, Narm Narman. So I can give an example, like, um, so there's a student, for example, we don't have any streaming in ninth grade, all the students are in the same class, all at three levels. And if the student is at the low level, like essential level, and if he doesn't understand any question or any topic, he will embarrass to ask the teacher because her classmates are in the academic level. And that's why she will not see any improvement. She will not improve herself. And there will be a big, like, I can say, unsuccess for her. That's why for me, streaming is very good, especially I think after eighth grade, like in ninth grade, we can stream. But um, I think we cannot 
uh, like um, remain the same level. For example, each three months we can apply some exams to like evaluate her level, the student's level. And for example, if the student in essential level, she just improved herself and she's ready to get to applied level, we can just change her class and it will both encouragement to her to uh, to, inf to improve her herself, yeah. let's say. Thank you. I think that's that's very insightful. The um, the benefit that I'm hearing in one word is is student health, right? It's it's so they can thrive in the environment that they're in. But I love that you added a way for them to change streams later, right? Which is often another part of the difficulty. Are there other benefits that people can think of? or maybe a disadvantage, uh, Meltem. I think um, that there can be some advantages, but normally in Turkey, in our classes, um, there, there is not uh, some advantage. But if the students are eager to learn something, else, couldn't hear properly is it a problem only with me or the others also have the same yeah problem? no she, she she's frozen for me as well yeah she's breaking up sometimes they come back and rush all their words at once <laughs> Oh, we'll see if she comes back in a minute or not. Oh, I think we lost her. Her connection's gone. She'll come back, hopefully. Any other thoughts? Any other benefits or disadvantages of um, streaming? Hello. Yes, Irene. Okay. Okay. Uh, for one benefit that I'm thinking about uh, streaming is, uh, you know, students, the same ability put together. So uh, it's easy for teacher to teach them and then they, you know, they can move forward. So that is one benefit. And yeah, so th they can also try their best and then do their work. And so this is, uh, they, yeah, what I want to say is that they can move forward and it also help teachers, you know, so they uh, teach them um, the same level. So there will be less um, distraction, I, th yeah. I, th I think. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Welcome back, Meltram. I know that uh, you, you okay. lost connection there for a second. Yeah, I lost my connection. Um, I was talking about that maybe we can give some support to him or her in the classroom, giving more homeworks or individual things to do. Maybe we can just make her level a little bit higher, but not uh, we can take make her the, uh, get get her or him to the academic level, or we we can just give him individual words or support a little bit, not to get shy in the classroom or not to get. Um, you know, embarrassed, I mean, in the classroom that he or she is the in the lower um, levels, let's yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is this is very good. Again, we're talking about the emotional ability of the student and their ability to adapt and how we recognize that. And so, um, yeah, I love these comments. Uh, Alina. Uh, yeah, I was about to mention um, a disadvantage of uh, streaming, right? Um, so when they are all mixed together, level-wise, right? Um, because I worked with uh, in this kind of environment last year, uh, what happened is that sometimes, you know, level three students, they're struggling to understand the material. However, uh, it um, 
it provokes collaborative uh, work. So for example, level one students can uh, often help level three students uh, with some assistance, translation, and uh, yeah, they would just motivate them to work better. And level one students are always motivation for level three students to perform better. Excellent. Yeah, you know, it's it's always interesting how uh, uh, an effective teacher can use the other students in the room to support the overall learning of what's going on in the classroom. And this is, um, for those of you, I, some of you are involved in teacher training and other things, this is so important as we encourage one another as teachers that we um, share the techniques and the abilities that work within our classroom to allow students to succeed, succeed at whatever level. Um, Saihan, did you have a comment? Uh uh, about academic streaming, um, yeah, I had a small uh, search uh, on the net, by the way, uh, and uh, there's uh, mostly people criticize and uh, make uh, negative comments about academic streaming. Uh, for example, uh, when we say uh, one of the uh, comments was, uh, Ontario is the only uh, province, I think, uh, uh, using or applying the academic streaming. Is it true or false? Is it a fake um, uh, uh, news or something? Is that true? Uh, yeah, I wonder this one. Yeah, Ontario by, by no means is the only place in the world that does streaming. Um, mm -hmm. you, you would think, um, I don't know if it's still today, but when I was, um, a younger man <laughs> teaching many years ago, we interacted with some teachers from Japan. And in Japan, uh, you are streamed um, mm -hmm. like in at age five, right? Oh, okay. yeah, it, yeah, it is interesting because and it depends not only on your potential academic ability, but they will do some testing. They will do some mm -hmm. IQ testing um, at very early ages, but it also depends on their wealth and depends on what class they're in. And so really streaming goes back um, even to um, British days in England, in the United Kingdom, of, of the class system. And I would assume, I don't know much about India, but India has a strong class system. And I'm assuming there would be this segregation um, all along the way. So streaming is an interesting thing because it's not only an academic issue, it's not only an intelligence issue, it can be a, an issue with wealth and poverty. Um, in streaming as well. I hopefully that makes sense. In academic streaming, I think uh, the aim is one of the aims is uh, um, creating a global class, a worldwide class. Yes. Uh, in a way, but uh, the comment, the negative thing about this, uh, if uh, the uh, the opportunities will be the equal, will be equal. That's the point I think about uh, academic streaming. Yeah. In a worldwide class. Yeah. Th this would be the goal, we hope. Yeah. We hope. Yeah. Uh, Iqbal. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. You mentioned something about how if a student gets streamed into a lower level, then they can climb back out of it. As in the English example, if they took a lower level English stream, then they can't climb out of it to a higher level English stream. Is that correct? Yes and no. So it's, it's, it's correct in the sense that if you succeed at a lower level, you, you, you get a credit for the grade nine essential English course. And so you, you succeeded. But in order to go up a level, the, the requirement to take the next level is only at the same stream. So a grade 10 essential level English student needs to have passed the grade nine essential. But in order to take grade 10 at a higher level, grade 10 academic, you would have need to take grade nine at that same level. So if you're essential level, you don't have the requirement to go to the next level. And this is where teachers and principals and vice principals and um, guidance counselors and special education teachers need to um, do something so that they can get the proper requirement to go up to the next level. 
So there would need to be an exception made. So somebody in grade nine, let's say you've got a grade nine essential level student who's getting a 100%. Well, obviously they're doing really well in essential level English. So likely a 100% a student could likely take applied English. And so sometimes in the middle of the year, we'll change them. So we'll remove them from grade nine essential and we'll put them into grade nine applied so that by the end of grade nine, they have the requirement to get into the grade 10 at the applied level. So, but again, if a teacher's not doing their work, that's not gonna happen. Hopefully that answered your question. That was what I was wondering. I was thinking that if they were indeed locked into say essential uh, stream for the rest of their time at school that must be very demoralizing so it's good to know that they can you know get out of it if they try hard yeah, yeah. and and the real life example and i can think of several students who would come to me as a vice principal and say mr reed why do i bother why do i bother because i'm only going to get this level and and then we would work with the teachers and the guidance counselors to say oh well how can we motivate this student to try harder because sometimes when they're they're, they, they're self-defeating, right? They just stop working, they don't try. And we can see that their, their, their ability is greater than their work ethic. And so sometimes we've demoralized them so they're not even willing to work. This is a good discussion. All right, well, I'm just noticing the time and I'd like to give you a break. So um, in, in my, in my, on my clock, it's 9.30 in the morning. Uh, but take a look at your clock and um, let's take five minutes. Okay, five minutes. So let's come back. I'm going to say, well, it's 928 here. Let's take seven minutes. So 935. So in seven minutes, come back. So just mute and turn off your camera. I'm going to do the same and I'll be back in, in seven minutes. Good. All right, hopefully um, you're there and uh, coming back online, and then we'll continue here in a minute. Excellent, I see a few faces. Thank you. Some thumbs up, I love it. All right. So um, we're gonna continue just through this module. There's a few more things I wanna highlight for you. Again, it's always important to actually do the work in the module online through Brightspace. Uh, please make sure you review that as well. And I'll highlight a few things about the Ministry of Education and the curriculum we use here in Ontario. Hopefully, you clicked on some of the links in the module that took you to the Ontario Ministry of Education website. I will tell you that the Ministry of Education's website has been interesting. I'm just going to mute him. Okay. And so what's going to happen is you'll see that some of the links are broken and some of the ways we get to things change. And so it's a normal frustration in Ontario. The ministry website changes lots and some of the links work and don't work over time. Um, ministry documents. And if you brought up one of the curriculum documents, you'll see it's built into sections. And so the ministry documents have three sections. They have the program planning section. Uh, they have the curriculum context and then the curriculum expectations and teachers support. It's interesting. Many teachers that I've taught with hardly ever looked at curriculum documents because they started teaching and, and then they just grew the course year after year. And the textbook, the book that they use that guides the students through the course, um, often the publisher or the author of that textbook knew the curriculum very well, so they built the textbook with the curriculum in mind. So sometimes, you, as a teacher, it's very easy to teach a course. You just follow a textbook. But that doesn't um, take away the responsibility of knowing the curriculum. And so when I had to um, evaluate and assess teachers, um, sometimes I found teachers were not doing their jobs. They were not able to um, follow the curriculum because they never looked at it. And what happens is curriculum can change over time. What I'd like to say at this point is not something that's been spoken about in the module online, but this is a key to understanding in, in our generation of teaching. I am now 59 years old, and I started teaching when I was 24. 
when I was 24, a teacher could go into a classroom, they could close the door, and what they taught, the, the students had to accept because the teacher was the expert. The teacher had all the knowledge. They gave the information to the students. I'm sure that many of you have been in environments where you've gone to learn from that person. But in today's world, with the internet and with access to information, it's changed greatly. I remember teaching um, when the internet was brand new and students had devices, a phone or something that they could look something up. And I had a student raise their hand and say, Mr. Reed, you are incorrect. You are wrong because the information on my phone is telling me something different. And we were talking about um, something between Canada and the United States in the classroom. And I asked him where his information was coming from. And it was from the UK government. And I didn't know why he was finding a website from the UK government to answer a question between Canada and the United States. And of course his information was bad. So he was getting information, but it was the wrong information. And so what has happened over time is we've changed curriculum that is information-based where the teacher just gives information to the students. And now, as you look through the Ontario curriculum, you'll know that most of that curriculum is what I will call skill-based. So it, it was in the past information-based, but now it's skill-based. Because in today's world, we are teaching skills. We are not necessarily teaching just information to be memorized. We're teaching skills. And, and it's interesting how teaching has changed over time. So I invite you as you look through the curriculum documents for the courses that you're teaching. Now, I believe one of you is teaching science, right? And so science is, is still going to be much more informational. However, it's going to be skill-based as well. But English is going to be more skill-based than informational. Uh, accounting is going to be more skill-based than informational. And so as you read um, these sections of the curriculum, I invite you to look for that difference. The next thing I want to point out is that um, as we've thought about the curriculum and what we're teaching, we are the experts. We are the experts in the knowledge and the information and the skills that we're teaching. So I am an expert at teaching accounting because I know accounting. I'm an expert at teaching economics because I know economics. I am not an expert in English, right? That was a problem subject for me as a student. But what happens is we all need to be experts in the way children learn. And so this is why special education is so important, right? We can be experts in the, in the knowledge and the information of the subjects we're teaching, but as teachers, all of us need to be experts in how students learn. And so special education is a really important topic. And in Ontario, there is a document called Learning for All. And you could go look it up online and you could read the whole document. It's very long. But essentially, Learning for All means that teachers must take the responsibility that everyone in their classroom has the ability to learn. Everyone, all children have the opportunity to learn. And in order to make that happen, we cannot do it alone. So in many schools in Ontario, we have a special education department. And these people don't teach a subject, they resource and allow the classroom teacher to um, communicate with them about specific students so that we can achieve success for all students. And so what happens is there's a committee. It's called the Identification, Placement and Review Committee, IPRC. And so this committee is multidimensional. It has many people involved. The principal might be involved, a psychologist might be involved, a child and youth worker might be involved, social services might be involved. And those people get together and they discuss students that have high needs. And so often the students that are operating at the essential or applied level are talked about first. Academic students that are achieving well in school often don't need the extra supports. Uh, 
But what we do is we spend a lot of time and energy making sure that those that are weaker in education can be raised up. And so special education does that. The whole purpose of an IPRC, of that committee, is to identify an individual student as exceptional. And that word exceptional could be at a high exception or at a low exception. It could be at either ends of the exception because we need to know what it is that makes that student different. They might have a diagnosis of autism. They might have a diagnosis of um, they're five years behind in their reading. But how do we know that? We can't do that on our own to make that decision. And so often a committee is formed to discuss the student. Then once the student is deemed exceptional, we put a plan into place to support that student. And that plan is called the Individual Education Plan, the IEP. Now it gets, it gets a little confusing. Sometimes we will put an IEP into place for a student, but they've never been um, determined exceptional. The committee has not reviewed about that student. So again, this is a problem with public education. In public education, if we've got, uh, if I'm a teacher and I'm teaching six courses and I've got 30 students in each course, I'm teaching 180 students. I will not be able to determine the individual needs of 180 students. I might not even notice a student in the back of the room who is not doing well. And I might not notice that um, they need, they're at the back of the room and they don't have their glasses on and they can't even read the board. I don't know because they're not saying anything. They seem to get their work done, but they need glasses. Now, if I knew that they couldn't see, I would get them an appointment with an optometrist to get their eyes checked, right? And so this is why it's so important that we work together because we have teacher conferences and we talk about students and we find out what their exceptions are because sometimes we actually can't get the professionals together to make that determination. So we will put an IEP in place just by noticing that a student needs some sort of help. At Blythe, at the Blythe Academy, just so you know, it's a private school. It doesn't do IPRCs. It doesn't do IEPs. It just puts a support plan in place because most Blythe schools have much smaller classrooms. And we know the parents, we know the families. And so we know much more about the student before they arrive. And so we can put those support plans in place. Once the plan is in place, we provide accommodations, either instructional accommodations, environmental accommodations, or assessment accommodations. One of the most comical accommodations we've ever put into place in, in, in my experience was we had a child who was um, blind and needed to go through the school with the, the white cane in order to find out where the doors were. And this environmental accommodation became comical because we had to put different things on the floor throughout the school so that when the blind child came through the school, they could tap with their cane and know where they were. And so we had some fun with these things. You know, in one corner, we put a stuffed animal on the floor and glued it to the floor so that when they went by, they would feel the teddy bear on the floor and all these things. And so the, the school became a bit more colorful because of these things that we put so the blind student could get through. Other accommodations would be very instructional accommodations. Sometimes um, we need to um, change the way we teach for specific students. So I might in front of my classroom know that every child in the classroom is gonna be able to follow my pace as a teacher. I'm just gonna be able to say things, write things on the board, ask students questions and everybody's gonna get along. But one student I have to slow the pace down for. So I might have an educational assistant come to the room and the educational assistant will um, help um, interpret what I'm saying more slowly for the student. And that student might only be in the classroom for half of the class. And then for the other class, half of the class, they'll go and work with the educational assistant outside of the room. It's an accommodation. Not every student needs it, but some students need it. So there'll be different things that we can do. And so 
again, on the ministry website and on the uh, during the module, there's some examples of some of those types of accommodations that we'll use. One of the um, most common assessment um, accommodations would be if we're issuing a test to the classroom. So it's the students come in, we have all their test papers, we assign them 40 minutes to do the test. Well, we know that some of the students will never be able to finish in 40 minutes and they're gonna need double time. They're gonna need 80 minutes. So instead of them coming to our classroom, we set aside another space for them to work on the test. Um, and so they have longer time to finish the test. Or they're in the classroom and they do the test with the other students, and then we dismiss the class, but that child stays and gets extra time to do the test. So it really depends on what their accommodations are and what's needed, but that is why we build the education plan so that or the support page so that we know what they'll need in order to succeed in our classroom. A lot of planning, right? I have, uh, just by a show of hands, just raise your hand if you've given accommodations to students in your classrooms before. How many of you have done that before? Have anybody given any of these extra time for tests? Have them leave the room early? So a few of you have, yeah, okay. All right. Any questions on the special needs before I move on? Okay, we'll move on then. If you have a question, just raise your hand later. Um, in Ontario, any teachers that teach in a publicly funded system, which is most teachers, need to be members of the Ontario College of Teachers. OCT. The Ontario College of Teachers is the regulating body in, in Ontario that allows um, teachers to teach. I have been a member in the past of the Ontario College of Teachers, and I have been allowed to teach and be a vice principal within a publicly funded system. In order to teach in a private or an independent school, you do not need to be part of the Ontario College of Teachers. However, any good private or any good independent school will require their teachers to hold to the same standards that are set out by the Ontario College of Teachers. And so there's three standards that are um, outlined from the Ontario College of Teachers, uh, practice standards, ethical standards, and then they have what's called the professional learning framework, which I call um, the lifelong learning standard. Right. So even what we're doing today would be considered part of number three, the professional learning framework, because what we're doing is we're coming together as educators and we're um, refreshing our knowledge about teaching. And so we're thinking again, how can we be the most effective teachers um, that we can be? And this is really the purpose of the Ontario College of Teachers is to continue to allow teachers to succeed in their teaching and not to. Um, become lazy or become ineffective as teachers. So really quickly, uh, the standards of practice, again, in the module, they took you to links and, and they explained this a bit more in depth, but just as an overview and to, to prompt any questions, um, there are five standards of practice. The first is that we're committed to students and student learning. You'll notice that the standard of practice is not to make the most money possible as a teacher. The standard of practice is not to be the, um, the Lord or the King of a classroom and to have authority over students. The standard is student learning. The second is that your professional knowledge is, is there. And again, this is why we learn and we continue to know how to do our practice of teaching best professional practice, that we take that knowledge and we implement it well in the classroom, that we try new things in the classroom, that we experiment, that we continue to refine our practice as teachers. Um, leadership in learning communities. Um, it's important not to just go and do your class and, and not be in touch with the other teachers in the school. 
Uh, it's really important to lead each other and to encourage each other. I like to call it, we need to encourage one another to best practice. And so this is really the leadership and learning communities. Uh, and then ongoing professional learning, which is really what number three is about, this ongoing framework of professional learning. So these are the standards. And so I would say it's always good. Um, I encouraged my teachers to two times a year to take a look at this chart that's on your screen and just to say, are you doing these things? So just as a, a check, a personal check, a self-evaluation, are you committed to students and their learning? Are you growing in your professional knowledge? Are you trying things in the classroom and practicing well? Are you helping your fellow teachers? Are you leading? Are you um, involved in ongoing professional development? Are you taking the courses when they come up and the opportunities? Good idea just to check in on that stuff. The next thing is ethical standards. Unfortunately, um, many teachers um, can tend to fail in their ethics as teachers. Um, the four words are care, trust, respect, and integrity. And so these really have to do with um, keeping uh, the job straight in your mind. We enter a classroom with high school students not to become their friends. We don't come in to replace their mother or father. We come in as teachers. Uh, the best way I can describe this is with three words. Be the teacher. Don't be anything else to your students. Be the teacher. Because sometimes we um, create a stronger connection with some students than with others. Well, to, to have care for all students, we have to make sure that we don't focus on our favorite students. We have to focus on all students. Um, we have to be trustworthy because we have... Um, Students. Students are the ones that um, get to make mistakes. Um, when I've had to discipline a teacher, it's often been around trust. Because what happens is um, a teacher will think that one student has done so well. They're, they're doing so well. And then they'll trust the student with lots of things. But what they forget is that student is still a child. And they start to treat that student as an adult. And then if that student disappoints them, they become very upset and they get all, you know, angry with the student. And they have to remember that it's just a student, right? And, and they get to make mistakes. And so um, if we get angry and we harm those students when they fail, we've lost their trust, right? So we have to keep that. Respect back and forth. Um, students need to respect their teachers. Teachers need to respect where their students are at. Um, and so, and then integrity. We need to make sure that we don't cross um, any lines. We don't cross any boundaries. Um, uh, teachers, we, we always say that if a teacher, not, it's, it's very hard for, it's very difficult to um, terminate a teacher in Ontario because they're part of a teacher union. It's very hard to fire a teacher. The the thing that will get a teacher fired every time is some sort of inappropriate relationship with a student, right? If the relationship becomes sexual or something like that. And so we have to be people of integrity and we have to maintain the right boundaries with our students. Ethical standards. And then lastly, the professional learning framework. And again, this is just the three words are lifelong learning. Let's just make sure we are continuing to learn and advance in our practice as teachers. I won't say much more about that because really it's there's documents online that you can read and go more in depth, but just continue to become a better teacher every day. And that's that's the best way. And that's that nobody, nobody, nobody forces you to do that. That's something that you just have to be willing and conscious of and take the opportunities as they come up. Now, are there any questions on these three things? And, and the first diagram here, you can see that they all blend together. So to be a professional teacher, we need all three of those things. Any thoughts, any questions?
it's a lot. And I would encourage you to go online and look at some of these documents a bit more in depth. Um, given that you're teaching with Blythe and in other countries, nobody's expecting you to get your credentialing with the Ontario College of Teachers because you don't need that. But again, to hold to those standards is good. Okay. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about today, and I wanted to have a bit of a discussion on, is the assignment. So in the Ontario College of Teachers, you had to do some reading, and there was four um, articles or four what we call professional bulletins uh, that we um, linked you to. Um, I have to remember what they're called. Uh, so one was on... Um, Here they are. One was on video conferencing guidelines. Another was on supporting students' mental health um, and professional boundaries, and then maintaining professionalism. What I'd love to do is just um, allow each of you um, to share one or two thoughts about some of the reading you did. And so, oops. So we're not going to break out. We're too small. I was originally expecting 20 people. So we were going to maybe do breakout groups, but we won't break out into groups. But I'd like you to share one learning from the professional advisories you chose and uh, then allow others to, to give some feedback to that. And so did anyone read the video guidelines one? And did you have a thought or a learning from that? Maybe let's start with Pinar. Sorry, Pinar, you need to unmute, I think. Yes, I know. Oh, there. Oh. <laughs> you muted again. Not working. Oh. You hear me now? Yes, good. Okay. Um, I have already uh, read the articles, and unfortunately, did my homework. Yeah. And upload it. Oh, you uploaded already? Yes. Unfortunately. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Just I chose two of them. Yeah. And write two uh, assignments uh, for you. There's something wrong with my computer. Mm. Can you ask the question again? Yeah. I'm just wondering if there was one thing that you learned that you'd like to share. Like, was there one highlight in one of the articles that you want to share? Okay. It's very important to. Um, about mental health, it was really, um, how can I say, it was really good for me to read about it. So I can learn how to uh, behave to my students, even though I don't have that kind of students, but I learn it and I learn how to approach them. And I, I also advise my uh, colleagues here to read that part. It's very important, I think. Good. And the boundaries. Boundaries is also, um, I also read it. And the other assignment about uh, myself, I choose boundaries. It was also very good. And I advise these two of them to my uh, colleagues here. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the learning around mental health, um, in, in general, I don't know if it's the same in the countries you're teaching in, but um, mental health problems have been on the rise here in Ontario. And so more and more anxiety, um, fear, um, embarrassment, these, these issues are very, very prevalent in Ontario schools. And so it's um, very important to know about that. Um, I think it's, it's the same in all over the world or in, in, in Turkey. Excellent, yeah. We so, have the same problems here in Turkey. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to know. Especially um, after the after the big earthquake in Turkey. Oh yes. Uh, yeah. Students have more anxiety. Yeah. Before that, we have the COVID problems, you know, and that that the problems started, I think, from there. And after that, we have the earthquakes, and their anxieties uh, got higher and higher. Yeah. Yeah. This COVID did the same here for us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Narmeen, did you have a comment? 
Mm, yes, I wanted to say that I have already read all these articles and I can say that all these articles are connected with each other. Yes. Like, let's say, use of uh, communication and um, social media. So if we use the social media communication right away, like uh, we don't use it to communicate with our friends, we just actually use it to teach our students. So we will also uh, follow the rules about the video conferencing mm -hmm. at the last that we should um, handle this with the conferencing in the teaching circumstances, not like uh, cheating or chilling with our friends. And also uh, about the boundaries, we should follow the boundaries and in order to keep the mental health of the students. So I wanted to say, all these articles are connected with each other. If you follow one, it means generally we will follow the another two. Yes. The most that uh, attracted my, uh, my attention was uh, about boundaries and supporting mental health. Unfortunately, I haven't done my homework yet. I was just wanted to uh, do it after the lesson because I wanted. To, if I, I was wondering if I get something new from the lesson, and I wanted to. Yeah. Well, and let me clarify that I only expect the assignments to be completed and submitted after we meet online, because it's important that we learn from one another as well. Are there other thoughts on the assignments? Do, any other learnings? Actually, I've read about the mental health um, uh, article. And I think as a teacher, we need to help the students by like being attentive, like offering empathy and connecting students to um, appropriate resources such as um, counseling services to ensure their well-being and academic success for their future as well. So it's really, really important and crucial for our students to tackle with their mental health challenges. Yes, that's very important. And just before I allow Iqbal to speak, I will say that um, it is so important to remember that you are not a professional health, a mental health professional. And so it's good to get as much resourcing as we can, but we also don't want to um, think that we have more knowledge than we do. So it's always, I love that you said that we need to get the right supports and resources for our students. Uh, Iqbal. Just want to build on that a little bit. Um, one of the parables I heard from a previous teacher was uh, she had this client that we all like to think, you know, oh, we don't have these kind of students, they're all fine, but this client out of the blue started throwing up red flags, mm -hmm. but unfortunately she neglected to prepare the appropriate context to reach out to in this kind of eventuality. And she was very worried that this person might you know, be suicidal, but mm -hmm. she couldn't really do anything about it. So I think it's important to keep in mind that even if we think, oh, you know, uh, my, not my students, you never know. And it's always good to be prepared than not. Excellent. I I totally agree. And, and again, this is where, if we think back to the um, IPRC, uh, the Identification Placement and Review Committee, a committee is so important, like having many people address the issue because we see different sides of the story, right? Um, and when students are in uh, potential harm to themselves, in our classroom, we might not see anything. But we might have that little thing in our head that says, oh, maybe there's something. Well, let's go talk to another person that deals with that student, right? Let's go talk with the parents. And it's just very important to get that all out into the open. Good. This is good. Any other thoughts on the articles that uh, you read? Any highlights? Hello. Uh, I chose the article about uh, professional boundaries. And what I learned from uh, this article is uh, professional, uh, sorry, uh, professions ethical standards, mm -hmm. including uh, you already mentioned in the presentation, care, respect, trust, and uh, integrity. These are very important for teachers to practice in order to build a healthy relationship between mm -hmm. teachers and students as well as parents. So if we can, if we, uh, I mean, teachers, if we can practice these ethical standards so the teaching and learning processes will go well so there will be less problem we will face in the uh, classroom yeah yeah so I, thank you excellent so key i appreciate that um one of the best resources a teacher has 
is to know a student's family, right? It's, 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 it's an amazing thing. We're not always able to know a student's family depending on the circumstance. Um, but I got to tell you, uh, it's so much more successful teaching when you're able to have that broader relationship with the family. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. And I want to add something that uh, sometimes it's so useful for teachers if they uh, have their own children. Yes. Especially teenagers. For example, I have my son, it's only 12 years old, but he's almost a teenager. And uh, it's so important just to notice day by day, this just a small uh, changes in the, in the behavior and so on. So it, helps you just to understand better your students and just to notice uh, better all the, these uh, small changes in their behavior. So it's, it's, it's always good to be watchful. And I think as well, I, I don't know if this happens worldwide, but here in Ontario, as a teacher, I will sometimes mention something to a parent that I've noticed in their child. And the parent will say, no, that's not, my child would never do that. No, no, no. And, and it's so important to remember that children behave differently in a classroom than they do at home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's good. All right. Any other thoughts? And yes. Actually, the last two weeks was uh, so busy uh, in my life. Uh, I had... Uh, uh, ninth grade son started just uh, a new school and my school is also a teacher of English and he, she has broken her leg oh no <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, it's something uh, it made me more busier in my life uh, but uh, I started to read uh, the article about bullying uh, and uh, uh, it made me a bit uh, more aware of uh, when we when we talk about bullying. Mostly we talk uh, we consider the students among themselves, but I I, I somehow recognized uh, uh, we talk, mostly the teachers don't take it seriously because they also in the same mood. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the point we miss, I think, about bullying. Maybe some this is something a regional fact. Maybe uh, not in other cities, but in in my school, in my school, uh, but uh, when I have a, uh, when I have read the article, uh, I uh, when I uh, consider and when I look at, at uh, look around in my school, uh, I also uh, aware that the, the teachers are also in the same mood. They bullying the teachers. They also bullying themselves, and then they uh, just say they, they expect the students not bullying the, um, among them themselves, but it's something. Uh, not related with the life and uh, they can't be the good examples uh, or uh, good icons for the students uh, and uh, I think I will re read the article again and then later I will read the other ones perfect yeah. thank you excellent any final thoughts good well, I think that uh, we've covered the material today. So I would encourage you, if you've not gone through the module yet, to do that quickly and then to um, write up your reflection and submit it. It just needs to be a few paragraphs long and just give a couple highlights. It, this is not uh, uh, this is not to give you a lot of work to do, right? This is just to get a couple of thoughts on paper um, so that we know that you've completed it. Then I will invite you over this next week to do module number two. And again, there will be a reflection assignment there. You can start working on it, but you don't need to submit it until after we meet next week. We will meet at the same time next week, and it will be the same Zoom link. Okay, so nothing changes. Also, this is for a little later on, but we're going to have five sessions together. So module one, two, three, four, and five. And there is a sixth module, module six. However, we will not meet after module six. Module six is about how to use Brightspace. And so that is just for your self learning. You can just look at that. But we will get together after module one, like we did today, then module two, three, four, and five. And so our last session will be on November the 7th. 
Okay. Now, just so you know, in Myanmar and in Turkey, you do not change your clocks by one hour ever. You just have the same time all year. In Ontario, we change our clocks at the beginning of November. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my time to keep your time the same. Okay? So we will always meet the same time in your countries. Good? Mm -hmm. Makes it easier. I'm the only one that needs to change. It's, it's just easy. <laughs> Yeah. You're welcome. And the next meeting is not next week on yeah. November 7th. No, no. No, no. no. So, so. The yeah, last that... meeting is on uh, November 7th. Yes. Yeah. 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 So we five meetings, one per week. Yeah. Okay. So I thank you for today. And uh, Narmeen, do you have a comment? I wanted to ask is there any decline time for assignment for submitting the reflection? No, as long as you get the reflection in by the end of the course. We should be fine. Yeah, there's no due yeah. dates. You're adults. I expect you to do your work. You you know already that if you um, get behind, it's just harder later. So just keep up. Do them as you can. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Any other questions before we go? Okay. I wish you all a good week. And we'll see you next week back here. And if you have any questions, email me and we'll go from there. All Thank the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.